Probably a lot of you know the story of the two salesmen who went down to Africa in the 1900s. They were sent down to find if there was any opportunity for selling shoes. And they wrote telegrams back to Manchester. And one of them wrote, situation hopeless, stop, they don't wear shoes. And the other one wrote, glorious opportunity, they don't have any shoes yet. Now, there's a similar situation in the classical music world, because there are some people who think that classical music is dying, and there are some of us who think you ain't seen nothing yet. And rather than go into statistics and trends and tell you about all the orchestras that are closing and the record companies that are folding, I thought we should do an experiment tonight. An experiment. Actually, it's not really an experiment, because I know the outcome. But it's like an experiment. Now, before we, <laughs> before we start, I need to do two things. One is I want to remind you of what a seven-year-old child sounds like when he plays the piano. Maybe you have this child at home. He sounds something like this. Brain magic. What's brain magic all about? Brain magic to me indicates you know, that area of magic dealing with psychological and mind reading effects. So unlike traditional magic, it uses like the power of words, linguistic deception, nonverbal communication, and various other techniques to create the illusion of a sixth sense. Now I'm going to show you all how easy it is to manipulate the human mind once you know how. And I want every downstairs also to join in with me and everybody here. I want everybody to put out your hands like this for me, first of all. OK, clap them together once. OK, reverse your hands. Now follow my actions exactly. Now, but half the audience has their left hand up. Why is that? OK, swap them around, put your right hand up. OK, now cross your hands over so your right hand goes over. Interlace your fingers like this. Now make sure your right thumb is outside your left thumb. That's very important. Yours is the other way around, so swap it around. Excellent. OK, extend your fingers like this for me. All right, tap them together once. OK, now, if you did not allow me to deceive your minds, you would all be able to do this. <laughs> so now you can see how easy it is for me to manipulate the human mind once you know how. <laughs> now I remember when I was about 15. I Mark Zuckerberg, a journalist, was asking him a question about the news feed. And the journalist was asking him, you know, why is this so important? And Zuckerberg said, a squirrel dying in your front yard may be more relevant to your interests right now than people dying in Africa. And I want to talk about what a web based on that idea of relevance might look like. So when I was growing up in a, in a really rural area in Maine, you know, the internet meant something very different to me. It, it meant uh, a connection to the world. It meant something that would connect us all together. And I was sure that it was going to be great for democracy and for our society. But there's this kind of shift in how information is flowing online. And it's invisible. And if we don't pay attention to it, it could be a real problem. So I first noticed this uh, in a place I spend a lot of time, my Facebook page. I'm progressive politically, big surprise. But I've always uh, you know, gone out of my way to meet conservatives. I like hearing what they're thinking about. I like seeing what they link to. I like learning a thing or two. And so I was kind of surprised when I noticed one day that the conservatives had disappeared from my Facebook. My title, Queerer Than We Can Suppose, The Strangeness of Science. Queerer Than We Can Suppose comes from J.B.S. Haldane, the famous biologist, who said, now my own suspicion is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. I suspect that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of or can be dreamed of in any philosophy. Richard Feynman compared the accuracy of quantum theories, experimental predictions, to specifying the width of North America to within one hair's breadth of accuracy. This means that quantum theory has got to be, in some sense, true. Yet the assumptions that quantum theory needs to make in order to deliver those predictions are so mysterious that even Feynman himself was moved to remark, if you think you understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. 
It's so queer that physicists resort to one or another paradoxical interpretation of it. David Deutsch, who's talking here in The Fabric of Reality, embraces the many worlds interpretation of quantum theory. Mockingbirds are badass. <laughs> they are. Mockingbirds, that's Mimus polyglottus, are the MCs of the animal kingdom. They listen and mimic and remix what they like. They rock the mic outside my window every morning. I can hear them sing the sounds of the car alarms like they were songs of spring. I mean, if you can talk it, a mockingbird can squawk it. So check it, I'm gonna catch mockingbirds. I'm going to trap mockingbirds all across the nation and put them gently into mason jars like mockingbird Molotov cocktails. Yeah. <laughs> and as I drive through a neighborhood, say, where people got a lotta, I'll take a mockingbird I caught in a neighborhood where folks ain't got nada and just let it go, you know? Up goes the bird, out come the words, Juanito, Juanito, vente a comer, mi hijo, oh. I'm gonna be the Johnny Appleseed of sound. <laughs> Cruising random city streets, rocking a drop-top Cadillac with a big back seat, packing like 13 brown paper Walmart bags full of loaded mockingbirds, and I'll get everybody. I'll get the nitwit on the network news saying we'll be back in a moment with more on the crisis. I'll get some asshole at a watering hole asking what brand the ice is. I'll get that lady at the laundromat who always seems to know what being nice is. I'll get your postman making dinner plans. I'll get the last time you lied. I'll get baby, just give me the frickin' TV guide. I'll get a lonely little sentence with a real error in it. Yeah, I guess I could come inside, but only for a minute. I'll get an ESL class in China. I think I was supposed to talk about my new book, which um, is called Blink and it's about snap judgments and first impressions, and it comes out in January, and I hope you all buy it in triplicate. Um, <laughs> but I was thinking about this, and I realized that, my, um, that although my new book makes me happy, and um, I think will make my mother happy, it's not really about happiness. Uh, so I decided instead um, I would talk about someone who I think has done as much to make Americans happy um, as perhaps anyone over the last uh, 20 years, a man who is a, a great personal hero of mine, um, someone by the name of Howard Moskowitz, who is most famous for reinventing spaghetti sauce. Um, Howard is, uh, Howard's about this high, and he's round, and he's um, in his 60s, and he has big, huge glasses and thinning gray hair, and he has a kind of wonderful exuberance and vitality, and he keeps a, has a parrot, and he loves the opera, and he's a great aficionado of, of uh, medieval history. And he, uh, by profession, he's a psychophysicist. Now, I should tell you that I have no idea what um, psychophysics is, although at some point in my life, I dated a girl for two years who was getting her doctorate. In the year 1919, a virtually unknown German mathematician named Theodor Kaluza suggested a very bold and in some ways, very bizarre idea. He proposed that our universe might actually have more than the three dimensions that we are all aware of. That is, in addition to left, right, back, forth, and up, down, Kaluza proposed that there might be additional dimensions of space that, for some reason, we don't yet see. Now, when someone makes a bold and bizarre idea, sometimes that's all it is. Bold, bizarre, but it has nothing to do with the world around us. This particular idea, however, although we don't yet know whether it's right or wrong, and at the end I'll discuss experiments which in the next few years may tell us whether it's right or wrong, this idea has had a major impact on physics in the last century and continues to inform a lot of cutting-edge research, so I'd like to tell you something about the story of these extra dimensions. So where do we go? To begin, we need a bit of backstory. Go to 1907. This is a year when Einstein is basking in the glow of having discovered the special theory of relativity and decides to take on a new... I wrote a letter last week talking about the work at the Foundation, sharing some of the problems, uh, and Warren Buffett had recommended I do that, being honest about what was going well, what wasn't, and making it kind of an annual thing. A goal I had there was to draw more people in to work on those problems, because I think there are some very important problems that don't get worked on naturally. That is, the market does not drive the scientists, the communicators, the thinkers, the governments to do the right things. And only by paying attention to these things and having brilliant people who care and draw other people in can we make as much progress as we need to. 
So this morning I'm going to share two of these problems and talk about where they stand. But before I dive into those, I, I want to admit that I am an optimist. Uh, any tough problem, I think it, it can be solved. And part of the reason I, I feel that way is looking at the past. Over the last century, average lifespan has more than doubled. Another statistic, perhaps my favorite, is to look at childhood deaths. As recently as 1960, 100... I'm going to let her introduce herself to everybody. Can you tell everybody your name? Einstein. This is Einstein. <laughs> Can you tell everyone hi? Hello. That's nice. Can you be polite? Hi, sweetheart. Much better. <laughs> well, Einstein is very honored to be here at TED 2006, amongst all you modern-day Einsteins. In fact, she's very excited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Since we've arrived, there's been a constant buzz about all the exciting speakers here for the conference. This morning, we've heard a lot of whispers about Tom O'Reilly's wrap-up on Saturday. Einstein, did you hear whispers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Einstein's especially interested in Penelope's talk. A lot of her research goes on in K's, which can get pretty dusty. Yeah, it could make her sneeze. But more importantly, her research could help Einstein find a cure for her never-ending scratchy throat. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Bob Russell was telling us about his work on nanotubes and his research at the microscopic level. Well, that's really cool, but what Einstein's really hoping is that maybe he'll genetically engineer a five-pound peanut. Oh, my God, my God, my God! Yeah, she would get really, really excited. <laughs> that is one big peanut. Since Einstein is a bird, she's very interested in things that fly. She thinks Bert Rutan is very impressive. Oh, well, good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Art Benjamin, and I am a mathemagician. What that means is I combine my loves of math and magic to do something I call mathemagics. But before I get started, I have a quick question for the audience. By any chance, did anyone happen to bring with them this morning a calculator? Seriously, if you have a calculator with you, raise your hand. Raise your hand. I, 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 did, was your hand go up? No, bring, bring it out. Bring it out. Anybody else? Um, I, see, I see one way in the back. You, sir, that, that's three. And uh, anybody on this side here? Uh, okay, you over there on the aisle. With the four of you with calculators, please bring out your calculators, then join me up on stage, and let's give these volunteers a nice round of applause. That's right. Now, since I haven't had the chance to work with these calculators, I need to make sure that they are all working properly. Would somebody get us started by giving us a... Uh, get a two-digit number, please. How about a two-digit number? 22. 22. And another two-digit number, sir? 47. Multiply 22 times 47. Make sure you get 1,034 or the calculators are not working. Do all of you get 1,034? 1,034? No. <laughs> 594. Let's give three of them a nice round of applause there. Uh, I'm going to speak today about the relationship between science and human values. Now, it's, it's generally understood that, that questions of morality, questions of good and evil and right and wrong, are questions about which science officially has no opinion. It, it's, it's thought that science can, can help us get what we value, but it can never tell us what we ought to value. And, and consequently, most people, I think most people probably here, think that science will never answer the most important questions in human life. Questions like, what is worth living for? What is worth dying for? What, what constitutes a good life. So I'm going to argue that this is an illusion, that the separation between science and human values is an illusion, and actually quite a dangerous one at this point in human history. Now, it's often said that science cannot give us a foundation for morality and human values because science deals with facts, and facts and values seem to belong to different spheres. It, it's often thought that, that there's no description of the way the world is that can tell us how the world ought to be. But I think this is quite clearly untrue. But values are a certain kind of fact. Okay, they, they I'm not quite sure whether I really want to see a snare drum at 9 o'clock or so in the morning. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's just great to see such a full theatre. And really, I must thank Herbie Hancock and his colleagues for such a great presentation. <laughs> One of the interesting things, of course, is the combination of that raw hand on the instrument and technology 
and of course what he said about listening to our young people. Of course, my job is all about listening. And uh, my aim really is to teach the world to listen. That's my only real aim in life. And it sounds quite simple, but actually it's quite a big, big job because, you know, when you, when you look at a piece of music, for example, if I just open my little motorbike bag, we have here, hopefully, a piece of music that is full of little black dots on the page. And, uh, you know, we open it up. I uh, was one of the founding members of the Axis of Evil comedy tour. Uh, the other founding members included Ahmed Ahmed, who is an Egyptian-American who actually had the idea to go to the Middle East and try it out before we went out as a tour. He went on solo and did it first. Uh, then there was Aaron Cater, who was the Palestinian-American. And then there was me, the Iranian-American of the group. Now, uh, being Iranian-American presents its own set of problems, as you know. Uh, those two countries aren't getting along these days. So it causes a lot of inner conflict, you know, like part of me likes me, part of me hates me. Uh, part of me thinks I should have a nuclear program, the other part thinks I can't be trusted with one. These are dilemmas I have every day. Um, but uh, I was born in Iran, I'm now an American citizen, which means I have the American passport, which means I can travel. Um, yeah, because if you only have the Iranian passport, you're kind of limited to the countries you can go to uh, with open arms, you know, Syria, Venezuela, North Korea. <laughs> so uh, anyone who's gotten their passport in America will tell you, when you get your passport, it still says what country you were born in. So I remember getting my American passport. I was like, woohoo, I'm gonna travel. And then I opened it up, it said, born in Iran. I'm like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> I'm trying to go places. <laughs> But what's I'm Jane McGonigal, I'm a game designer. Uh, I've been making games online now for 10 years, and uh, my goal for the next decade is to try to make it as easy to save the world in real life as it is to save the world in online games. Now, I have a plan for this, and it entails convincing more people, including all of you, to spend more time playing bigger and better games. Right now, we spend three billion hours a week playing online games. Some of you might be thinking, that's a lot of time to spend playing games, maybe too much time, considering how many urgent problems we have to solve in the real world. Um, but actually, according to my research at the Institute for the Future, uh, it's actually the opposite is true. Three billion hours a week is not nearly enough gameplay to solve the world's most urgent problems. Um, in fact, I believe that if we want to survive the next century on this planet, we need to increase that total dramatically. I've calculated the total we need at 21 billion hours of gameplay every week. So that's probably a bit of a counterintuitive idea, so I'll just I'll say it again, let it sink in. If we want to solve problems like hunger, poverty, climate change, global conflict, obesity... I, hey, I am Michael Shermer, the director of the Skeptic Society, the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. We investigate claims of the paranormal, pseudoscience, and fringe groups, and cults, and claims of all kinds between. Science and pseudoscience and non-science, junk science, voodoo science, pathological science, bad science, non-science, and plain old nonsense. And unless you've been on Mars recently, you know there's a lot of that out there. Some people call us debunkers, which is kind of a negative term, but let's face it, there's a lot of bunk. And we are like the bunko squads of the police departments out there flushing out. Well, we're sort of like the Ralph Naders of bad ideas, <laughs> trying to replace bad ideas with good ideas. I'll show you an example of a bad idea. I brought this with me. This was uh, given to us by NBC Dateline to test. It's, the, uh, it's produced by the Quadro Corporation of West Virginia. It's called the Quadro 2000 Dowser Rod. <laughs> this was being sold to high school administrators for $900 a piece. It's a piece of plastic with a Radio Shack antenna attached to it. You can douse for all sorts of things, but this particular one was built to douse for marijuana in students' lockers. <laughs> so the way it works is you go down the hallway and you see if it tilts toward a particular locker and then you open the locker. So, so for the past year and a half, my team at Push Pop Press and Charlie Melchers and Melcher Media have been working on creating the first feature-length interactive book. It's called Our Choice and the author is Al Gore. It's the sequel to An Inconvenient Truth. 
and it explores all the solutions that will solve the climate crisis. The book starts like this. This is the cover. As the globe spins, we can see our location, and we can open the book and swipe through the chapters to browse the book. Or we can scroll through the pages at the bottom. And if we want to zoom into a page, we can just open it up. And anything you see in the book, you can pick up with two fingers and lift off the page, and open up. And if you want to go back and read the book again, you just fold it back up and put it back on the page. And so this works the same way: you pick it up and pop it open. I consider myself among the majority. We look at windmills and feel they're a beautiful addition. And so throughout the whole book, Al Gore will walk you through and explain the photos. This photo, you. And now we go live to Caracas to see one of Maestro Abreu's great proteges. He is the new musical director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra. He's the greatest young conductor in the world, Gustavo Dudamel. <laughs> I was here four years ago, and I remember at the time that the talks weren't put online. I think they were given to TEDsters in a box, a box set of DVDs, which they put on their shelves, where they are now. <laughs> and actually, Chris called me、uh, a week after I'd given my talk and said, "We're going to start putting them online. Could we put yours online?" I said, "Sure."、Um, and four years later. As he said, it's been seen by four. Well, it's been downloaded four million times. So I suppose you could multiply that by twenty or something to get the number of people who've seen it. And as Chris says, there is a hunger、um, for videos of me. <laughs> you know. Don't you feel? So this whole event has been an elaborate build-up <laughs> to me doing another one for you. So here it is. <laughs>、um, <clears throat> Al Gore spoke at the TED conference I spoke at four years ago, and talked about. Just a few minutes ago,、uh, I took this picture、uh, about ten blocks from here. This is the Grand Cafe、uh, here in Oxford. I took this picture because this turns out to be the first coffee house to open in England in, in 1650. That's its great claim to fame, and I wanted to show it to you not because I want to give you the kind of you know Starbucks tour of historic England,、uh, but rather because the English coffee house was crucial to the development、uh, and spread of one of the great intellectual flowerings、uh, uh, of the last 500 years, what we now call the Enlightenment, and the coffee house. Played such a big role in in the birth of the Enlightenment, in part because of what people were drinking there, right? Because before the、uh, the, the spread of coffee and and tea through British culture, what people drank, both elite and and mass folks drank day in and day out from from dawn until dusk, was alcohol, right? Alcohol was the daytime beverage of choice. You would drink a little beer with breakfast and have a little wine at lunch, a little gin, particularly around 1650,、um, and、uh, top it off with a little beer and, and wine at the end of the day. That was the healthy choice, right? Because the Water wasn't safe to drink,、uh, and so effectively, in, until the rise of the coffee house, you had an entire population that was effectively drunk all day.、Um, 
Once upon a time, at the age of 24, I was a student at St. John's Medical College in Bangalore. I was a guest student during one month of a public health course, and that changed my mindset forever. The course was good, but it was not the course content in itself that changed the mindset. It was the brutal realization the first morning that the Indian students were better than me. <laughs> You see, I, I, I was a study nerd. I loved statistics from a young age, and I studied very much in Sweden. I used to be in the upper quarter of all courses I attended, but in St. John's, I was in the lower quarter. <laughs> and the fact was that Indian students studied harder than we did in Sweden. They read the textbook twice or three times or four times. In Sweden, we read it once, and then we went party. <laughs> and, and that to me, that personal experience was the first time in my life that the mindset I grew up with was changed. And I realized that perhaps the Western world will not continue